Uh, thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you to IISS um, for inviting me. Um, I feel I'm at rather a, a disadvantage for, for two reasons. One, uh, I'm keeping you from your lunch, perhaps. Um, and two, as a journalist, I'm uh, an observer of events, and here I am talking to a room full of practitioners and experts, and that's not the uh, natural order of things. Um, so I'm hesitant. But then when I was thinking of my remarks uh, for today, I was think trying to find a word to describe uh, the West's posture at the moment. And I don't think there's a better word than hesitancy. The West is hesitant. I was struck um, by Amos Yadlin's remarks at, uh, at the beginning of his, uh, very, his excellent uh, uh, comments in the last session that uh, there's a danger in life that we can, that you move from a, a period of hyperactivity uh, to one of inaction, uh, perhaps even uh, paralysis. And that's the direction I think uh, we've been heading. We're rushing for the exit in Afghanistan. Um, we're replacing ambitions for uh, nation building or nation stabilization uh, with drones. Um, and we've been hesitant all the way through in our response to the Arab uprisings and latterly to the war uh, in Syria. And during this period, I think, if you think back uh, to the turn of the uh, millennium, um, the hyperpuissance, as the French referred to the United States, has become the hesitant and the selective superpower. Um, as for my own continent, uh, Europe, uh, much of it as I think I once said before to a IISS conference, much of it spends its time hiding under the bed covers. Um, and I think there are three reasons for this, and this, the relevance, I think, of this, uh, to this session is the first reason is economics. Um, the, I think it's impossible to underestimate the continuing shock uh, delivered uh, by the financial crash. The shock, the real shock in terms of macroeconomics to our economies, the structure of our economies, and the shock to confidence, to political uh, as well as economic confidence delivered by the crash. We've seen, I think, in recent months, um, signs of life in Western economies again. Uh, the US has proved, as it often does, uh, to be more resilient uh, than most people um, expected. Uh, even in Europe, even in my own country, Britain, um, it seems that we may have at last moved out of recession. But I don't think anyone should underestimate or expect the beginnings of a rather slow economic upturn to change the fiscal picture either in the US or in Europe, dramatically. The facts of the next five years will be of a very, very significant fiscal squeeze, both in the US and in Europe. And a lot of the burden of that squeeze will fall, of course, on defense budgets. We've seen this year in the US sequestration uh, begin to come into effect um, with cuts, uh, with very deep first-year cuts. But those are small compared to the cumulative effect of sequestration over, if it were to go on, for 10 years, $500 billion in cuts over five years. But even if, and it's a, it's a big if, given the state of politics in, uh, in Washington at the moment, even if, by some miracle, Republicans and in Congress and the White House come to uh, an agreement on uh, short of sequestration to, to bring down the deficit, 
to combine some tax increases with cuts in entitlement spending, uh, US spending on the military is going to fall very sharply. I think President Obama's uh, budget plans suggest uh, over 10 years a fall uh, to about 2.5% of GDP, 2.6% of GDP. That's a big reduction. And the Defense Secretary, Chuck Hagel, set out, I think, in the summer some of the consequences of that for US military punch and reach. I think the choice he presented was one of the US sustaining its existing capabilities now and under-investing in the future, or taking risks with spending now to avoid falling behind 20 years hence. In Europe, the situation as far as military spending, defense spending is much, uh, is concerned, is much bleaker. Um, cuts of, real cuts of 10 or 20% have been common. Uh, the recent French white paper uh, suggested the best that France could do, and this is better than everyone else, is a freeze in spending. In the UK, depending on how you calculate them, the government talks of spending cuts that uh, over the last few years of 8 or 9%. I think in real, in real life, it's closer to 20%. So the pretense that countries like France and Britain can retain full-spectrum capabilities is now impossible to sustain. Uh, witness what's happened in Mali. Witness uh, uh, what happened before in Libya um, and, uh, and so on. So, as far as Europe's concerned, the euro crisis, uh, the crisis, if you like, of the euro, the existential threat to the single currency uh, is probably past, but the crisis within the euro, the economic crisis, the adjustment process that's necessary will continue for some years. Now, before I move on, I'm just going to add a cautionary word here. It's what happened, I think, at the beginning of this century is that the West overestimated its power. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate our power now. Uh, the US, even with cuts in expending, will, is still now, will still be spending as much for the next few years as the next 10 uh, uh, powers. So our, the power, the military power of the West is there. I think what's changed is the perception of that power, which takes me to my second point, which is public opinion. Because public opinion is pulling in precisely the same direction as economics. And there's obviously cause and effect here. Um, politics has turned against liberal interventionism. It's partly about Iraq, partly about the war in Afghanistan, but it's also about the economy. The instinctive response of voters to long periods of austerity is to try to shut the doors against the rest of the world, whether that's to immigrants or whether it's to wars of choice. And I think there are some, some sort of deeper currents uh, at play here. I think at uh, the end of the Cold War during the 1990s, there was a sense that the West could fix things in the rest of the world. If we put our minds to it, we could actually reorder uh, troublesome nations and troublesome uh, regions. And that we had, as we watched 24-hour news, we had a duty to do that. I think the mood now is that for all our horror at what's happening in Syria and elsewhere, there's a growing mood of there's nothing much we can do. So in the US, we're seeing the right of the Republican Party join with the left of the Democrats in shunning entanglements. And as I said, in much of Europe, we're hiding under the bed covers. Syria's been a hard case, and undoubtedly, it's been badly handled by political leaders, including David Cameron, uh, as well as, I think, by Barack Obama. But the antipathy to getting involved among electorates is not something that we should underestimate. And then the third element in this 
if you like, equation is the obvious one. Our power is contested in a way that it wasn't 10 years ago. If you look at what China's been doing in terms of its defense budget, pushing back against the US in the East and South China Seas, its more assertive posture towards its neighbors, um, others are building new military capabilities, uh, not necessarily directed against the West, but they are building their militaries. India now has, I think, its, has launched its first homemade or home-designed aircraft carrier. Um, the last time I was in Stockholm uh, a few months ago, uh, Carl Bilton noted that the Vietnamese were conducting sea trials of a new Russian-made submarine in the Baltic. So Western power is being contested in a way that it hasn't been before. And it's also being contested in the political sense. The one thing that the rising states share, despite all their differences, is a commitment to state sovereignty. And they're pushing back in a way, in a much stronger way. And we've seen that over Syria, but we've also seen it uh, over North Korea and others pushing back against the idea, the liberal interventionist idea, that there is a, an international set of rules which on occasion can take primacy over state sovereignty. So what's the response of governments to this? Well, the response has been, I think, so far, that governments have been reassessing their reach and capabilities. The idea common a few years ago that the West could and should confront threats at a distance is giving way to one that we better concentrate resources towards defense of the homeland. I think within military budgets, we're seeing a move away from big armies with expeditionary, uh, with the capacity to sustain long expeditionary campaigns to special forces, to air forces, to navies. We're spending in the UK, even if, as we cut spending on defense, on hard defense, we're spending more, for example, on intelligence. I think everyone in the West is taking a much sharper view, a narrower view of national interest. And I think that was behind the uh, President Obama's attempt to pivot away from the Middle East towards Asia, Although, as we've seen, the Middle East has a habit of pulling Washington back. But I think looking out over the next five years and looking at the economic and political background, I think the impulse towards drawing back will strengthen rather than wane. Where does it leave us? It leaves us, I think, with uh, the need for European countries to try to leverage power in different ways by, in terms of military strength, by moving much faster towards sharing, pooling, sharing uh, capabilities, but progress so far is slow. It leads us to trying to build up networks of regional allies. It's, I think one of the interesting things about US foreign policy in the last few years has been the, the, big, the refurbishment of its relationships in Asia and the Pacific. I think in Britain and France, you've seen uh, much more effort, diplomatic effort, go into building relationships with the Gulf states, uh, for example. But overall, I think the net result of geoeconomics meeting geopolitics, if you like, is that a much more fragmented world in which we no longer have, feel we have the confidence uh, to shape outcomes. Um, that leaves us, fortuitously, with a question, um, which is who now manages international security? Um, and that question, of course, will be answered tonight in our dinner discussion. Thank you.